Hello and welcome, my name is Neil Dilworth and welcome to the first lecture in uh, our 2019-2020 University of Toronto Sports and Exercise Medicine Lecture Series and Drill Club. Today we'll talk about uh, doping and sport, um, World Anti-Doping Agency and uh, our roles as uh, physicians um, in sports. So let's get started. Uh, overview of today's lecture, we'll talk about um, some of the history um, behind uh, doping in sport, uh, just to give an idea of how prevalent uh, it can be in certain sports. Um, we'll talk about both uh, sport-wide doping uh, situations as well as state-endorsed doping, followed by a um, uh, in-depth overview of the World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list uh, with examples of reporting standards and drugs and methods, and as well as uh, examples of detection and then we'll talk uh, finally about the, the physician role uh, in sports. So first off, um, uh, in terms of the de objectives, definitely want to be aware of the World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list, and we want to be aware of um, how prevalent um, uh, both doping and um, can be, as well as uh, the importance of screening for performance enhancing drugs amongst our athletes. And it's important to understand our role as a physician uh, in um, in this realm. So, uh, 2016 WADA released a report uh, uh, about um, the um, top top uh, doping violations in sports, um, and the top three sports involved were athletics, bodybuilding, and cycling. Uh, I've included uh, on the inset there are three images. The, the one in the center is uh, often referred to as the dirtiest race in history. Uh, this is a um, um, pictogram of the 100-meter uh, final in the 1988 uh, Summer Olympics that took place in Seoul. Um, of the eight uh, competitors in that final uh, heat, uh, only two uh, at no point in their career or life um, did not test positive for performance enhancing drugs or admit or confess to using performance enhancing drugs and that was the uh, fifth place and eighth place athlete. Um, all others had either tested positive either at that point in their career or later in their career and or had confessed to using performance enhancing drugs at some point later in their career. Um, most of that, uh, the performance and drugs that were involved uh, were anabolics, um, but there was also uh, growth hormone used even at this stage back in the, um, the 1980s. Um, it's probably to nobody's surprise that uh, bodybuilding um, has a long history of performance and drug use, mainly anabolics and growth hormone. In the inset there is a uh, English athlete by the name of Dorian Yates, who was Mr. Olympia six, uh, for six consecutive times. Um, and um, admitted to um, both using a combination of anabolic steroids as well as growth hormone. And then finally, um, uh, cycling, which came up third in list. This is going to come up again and again in our, our talk today um, from a sport perspective um, as an example of um, widespread performance enhancing drug use. But um, obviously, uh, that's a picture of Lance Armstrong. Um, uh, with uh, admitted um, performance enhancing drug use. He was stripped of um, all his uh, Tour de France wins and um, um, admitted uh, to or suspected of use for erythropoietin, growth hormone, and anabolics, as well as others, including glucocorticoids. Uh, in terms of sport wide doping, um, as you see once again with the cycling, multiple doping scandals. Um, as of 2014, 12 of the last 24 winners had either tested positive or confessed to doping. Um, that's a fairly high percentage uh, of the top echelon of the sport. Uh, Major League Baseball uh, went through what was referred to as the steroid era. Um, not a um, well-defined time period, but expanded. This, this essentially went over a decade. Um, and the the findings of the Mitchell report released in 2007. Um, this, this report actually in, in included a um, uh, Balco investigation, which um, leads to our next uh, sport, which is NFL. Um, uh, 
with uh, suspected widespread NFL abuse. The, the Falco investigation actually named a number of NFL athletes. This is a uh, San Francisco area laboratory that was essentially providing athletes with uh, performance enhancing drugs. Um, then when we go from sport based, we go uh, unfortunately to a couple of examples where um, it was actually state endorsed doping. Most recently the uh, Russian doping scandal uh, suspected to have started in response to a um, poor medal showing in the 2010 Winter Olympics and um, suspected to range from about 2011 to 2015. Um, between the years 2013 and 2015, Russia accounted for about 1 in 10 of all um, WADA anti-doping rule violations and implemented this scandal, uh, which broke initially with a German documentary in 2014, where athletes, coaches, medical officers, and in fact, the uh, state anti-doping agency. Um, 2015, WADA released an independent report on Russia um, which led to uh, sanctions uh, against the against Russia uh, in future participation in uh, Olympics. Um, historically, um, uh, even going back further than that, uh, there was the example of the East German, um, which had the Staatsplan uh, 1425. This is a government initialized plan to incentivize winning. Um, specifically international competitions, um, widespread um, anabolic uses, specifically uh, turnabol, uh, but other preferred standards and drugs use, uh, which led to a number of short-term side effects which were well documented as part of the program, and then a number of long and lifelong side effects as a result of um, large doses, um, mostly unknown, uh, of anabolics and other performance enhancing drugs uh, at critical development periods uh, for an, in an athlete's life, um, in these athletes' lives. Um, the World Anti Doping Agency, which is um, centralized in, in uh, Montreal, is um, the producer of the annual prohibited list, and this is. Um, partly to ensure um, athletes um, and sports safety, but also to ensure uh, fairness in sport. Um, the prohibited list consists of uh, 10 different substance categories and three methods, as well as a, a um, category for substances that are prohibited, prohibited in particular sport that used to include alcohol, but is now just, uh, it just includes uh, beta blockers. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, the different categories and talk about some um, performance enhancing drugs which um, um, are, are more commonly used um, as broad categories, what um, their, their purported uses are for and their side of potential side effects, uh, as well as the detection processes um, that WADA and um, the scientists have developed to detect these in, um, in athletes. So um, the 10 categories, which we'll go through um, shortly, um, there's also um, three specifically with respect to methods. Um, we'll mainly talk about the manipulation of blood and its components through blood doping. Um, but just to be aware that there's both chemical and physical manipulation of samples that takes place. This is part of um, what was involved in the uh, Russia doping scandal. And finally, gene doping. Um, I've left gene doping out uh, for a number of reasons. Most of the, the current uh, literature and evidence uh, suggests that um, we're, we're not at a state where uh, gene doping is a uh, plausible and safe um, method for uh, enhancing athletes' performances uh, at this point. A number of issues with um, the uptake process of, of uh, performance enhancing genes in athletes, um, uh, as well as significant uh, adverse effects uh, to an athlete's health by partaking in, the, uh, in this, but this is probably something we'll be talking more about in the future. So um, going back to cycling, um, we can see from uh, documented um, uh, drug use in international cycling, 
um, that essentially um, cycling gives a great example of essentially uh, performance enhancing drugs used across um, multiple categories of the WADA prohibitive list. Um, obviously anabolic agents um, have been widely described and widely used um, by participants over the years. Um, erythropoietin uh, for its um, uh, um, red blood cell uh, production enhancement uh, capabilities, uh, human growth hormone, uh, HCG, um, the abuse of uh, beta-2 agonists uh, in the sport, the use of diuretics and masking agents to hide um, potentially EPO, human growth hormone, as well as uh, anabolic usage, use of stimulants uh, during these endurance races, and then uh, narcotics, cannabinoids, um, uh, as well as, as glucocorticoids, as well, um, from the uh, Lance Armstrong um, uh, case. Um, and then uh, from a methods perspective, obviously blood doping is a huge concern uh, you know, within cycling, but also the use of uh, some other modulators of oxygen transfer, including hydroxyethyl starch and perfluorocarbons. Uh, like previously mentioned, um, uh, the use of beta blockers is prohibited in, in particular sports, uh, mainly those which uh, require the slowing of the heart rate to, uh, to, to potentiate accuracy. Um, this can involve shooting uh, sports, um, archery, shooting, golf, darts, um, but also um, uh, sports like driving and, and billiards. So now we're going to talk about specific uh, performance enhancing drugs within their categories. Um, what you see here, and this is one of the uh, first concerns we'll, we'll talk about, um, is this is an example uh, of a anabolic agent. This is uh, it's referred to as, uh, in this example, an anabolic um, supported to contain testosterone. Uh, this is brought in by a patient um, asking about uh, the safety of its use. Um, acquiring these drugs um, has been described in the, in the literature as through a number of routes. Um, one is through um, countries where the substances are not uh, controlled. Um, and um, usually these are from countries where the regulations for manufacturing are um, far less strenuous. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, what might be contained in this product um, is, is, for the most part, unknown. Um, you can see how um, it's also produced in terms of the packaging. It looks fairly legit legitimate in that you have essentially a lot number, expiry number. It gives it essentially a dose and uh, vial size. Um, looks fairly similar to packaging that you would see for um, medications that we might use in, in the hospital setting or in a clinic setting. Um, other ways that um, um, athletes might procure these are through underground labs um, or the illegal procurement through um, getting these through um, either from veterinary sources or um, through medical sources where they've been prescribed to um, patients that require them for other medical conditions and then sell them on. So with respect specifically to anabolic steroids, um, these are cholesterol-based hormones. There's multiple different forms, both oral, oral and injectable. Um, the exogenous steroids will lower um, your natural testosterone levels. Um, and then um, there are agents that will be used to both uh, decrease that effect, but also to counter the uh, estrogen effect that is often produced by taking exogenous steroids. So the use of things like tamoxifen um, and other um, uh, uh, estrogen uh, blockers or um, um, agents are used to essentially decrease the uh, negative estrogen effects uh, from using exogenous steroids. Um, the anabolic uh, steroid risks are, are numerous. Uh, they can be anything from essentially uh, excessive hair growth to changes in voice, uh, gynecomastia, elevated uh, kratin, um, mood disorders, osteoporosis, and then a number of cardiac effects. Um, it's usually threefold. There's a, essentially, obviously, the, um, the effect on the, specifically the cardiac um, uh, muscle tissue. 
um, the analogs also increase um, the viscosity of blood and have a pro-thrombotic uh, effect. And then they also increase your lipids um, and can advance uh, the atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic process. Um, this can lead to obviously hypertension, but also cardiomegaly and uh, significantly increase your risk of myocardial infarction. The difficulty in quantifying this is these are some of the side effects from using um, exogenous uh, steroids in physiological doses. Um, often these are used um, essentially uh, in combination with other anabolic steroids at super physiological doses. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of the, the overall risk, we're, we're not entirely certain of how significant these how much more significant how much more significant these risks are as a result of we don't have studies on these much higher doses that are being used this is just a, essentially a um, biochemical chart uh, outlining um, how um, the both the uh, progesterone and the androgen pathways are both fairly complex but there's a number of different ways that they can be modified and um, designer drugs will essentially um, be produced to modify anywhere along these pathways to get a further anabolic effect. Um, obviously, some of these are, are not well, obviously not well uh, tested, um, and um, obviously have the potential of having just as much negative impact as they do positive in a number of cases. Um, in terms of steroid detection. Um, there are two types of athlete biological passports. Um, there's one module, which is the hemo, uh, hematological pathway, and then there's the steroid um, um, method. And for steroid detection, they look at a number of different ratios. Um, we'll see in the next slide. Uh, it can also be detected not just from blood, but also from, from urine. This is an example of a normal steroid passport. Um, you can see the four different ratios. The red are the outlying, um, essentially the abnormal values, high and low, and blue would be essentially different values um, um, from samples given from the athlete. Just to give you an example, once again going back to cycling, um, 2006 uh, Floyd Landis um, had a sample um, which throw, showed that his testosterone to epi uh, testosterone was 11 to 1. Uh, and just to give an idea of that, that um, ratio is typically or normally four to one. Uh, in terms of uh, subcategory two, uh, this includes the post peptoid hormones, growth factors, related substances, and mimetics. Um, once again, I've given a display an image here. This is a, another product brought in by another patient. Once again, asking about safety of this product. Similarly, once again, you can uh, take a look, and it looks like packaging wouldn't be much different from. Uh, medications that would be available through a hospital pharmacy. Um, you have, uh, you see there's one, one vial missing, there's nine vials which contain a uh, precipitant substance, a powder substance of some sort, which is meant to be a human growth hormone. And um, on the left you can see a larger bottle which is essentially meant to be a dilutant. Um, and um, according to the patient, he was advised to take essentially one vial a week by giving uh, himself daily subcutaneous injections uh, of this substance. Um, we're going to talk about growth hormone in a second, but uh, in terms of um, uh, one of the other peptide hormones, um, and once again, very commonly uh, abused in cycling sports, uh, erythropoietin. Um, this is uh, essentially a hormone that's uh, naturally produced by the kidneys, um, which we'll see in a diagram on the next page, um, which essentially leads to increased uh, red blood cell production in the um, bone marrow. Um, this, this, although it can increase your oxygen carrying ability um, in the blood, it also uh, unfortunately increases your uh, blood viscosity and uh, the um, potential uh, thrombotic events that can occur as a result of this. Um, the other um, uh, uh, thing I put together with this is the method number one, uh, which includes blood doping. Um, they typically go hand in hand. Like I said, most uh, 
performance enhancing drugs are used in combination, so it's not uncommon for health athletes to use a combination of erythropoietin and that are doping along with um, some kind of blood transfusion, um, autologous or, or homologous. These can be quite difficult to detect. Obviously, autologous is more difficult to detect than homologous. Um, and this is why we get into um, the, the use of the uh, athlete biological passport. This is an example of a normal athlete biological passport. This is the hematological method. Um, it takes a number of parameters, uh, including hemoglobin and reticulocyte count and so on, and different ratios and values, uh, taking pay the athlete's uh, blood samples over periods of time and plotting them in against uh, essentially normal high values and normal low values to see if there's any kind of outliers. And just to give an example, this is an abnormal athlete uh, biological passport. And, and you can see a number of values that are uh, outliers uh, in a number of these different scores. Um, it's uh, important to know that essentially there are some training methods that can alter these values, uh, such as training at altitude. And um, what's important to know is that it's part of actually the, uh, the a lot of testing um, that they don't just take the sample, they actually um, um, ask you questions from a questionnaire to ask you about changes in training um, and changes in altitude at different points uh, so that they can essentially put this into the algorithm to a lot for uh, potential changes. Um, we go back to the, the risks of both uh, using erythropoietin and blood doping. Um, obviously, there's a risk for uh, thrombotic events, like I mentioned. There's a, by increasing the blood viscosity, it puts you at risk of stroke and myocardial infarction and peripheral emboli. Um, with erythropoietin, there's also an autoimmune side effect, which can lead to pure red cell aplasia. Um, with blood transfusions, um, because the damage to the red blood cells can be free iron and therefore increase oxidative damage to the cardiovascular tissues, uh, immune reactions if you're using homologous uh, blood transfusions, um, some of the other substances that are used to increase the oxygen carrying uh, capacity are cobalt, uh, can cause cardiomyopathy. Interesting enough, this uh, was initially described as uh, Quebec beer drinking car uh, cardiomyopathy as cobalt used to be used to stabilize uh, the head of beers. Um, cobalt can also uh, cause hypertension, uh, thrombotic events, and organ damage, as can some of the synthetic uh, oxygen carriers, such as uh, perfluorocarbons, uh, that can cause death, visual deficits, and, and organ damage. So these are fairly significant uh, risks. And now, although not proven, there have been a number of deaths uh, in, um, I believe there's been six uh, deaths in uh, international cyclists uh, since 1980. Um, although it's not been proven, but it's uh, definitely potential that the, some of these blood doping um, uh, mechanisms may be implicated in, uh, in those, those deaths. Um, we move on to uh, uh, growth hormone, um, IGF-1, as well as insulin. Um, insulin, which is technically in the substance um, uh, 4 category. Um, they work on a similar pathway uh, to uh, induce anabolic um, lipolytic effects and also protein synthesis. It's a separate pathway uh, to the anabolic steroids, which were previously discussed. Um, thus, they're often combined um, uh, to essentially further um, uh, the performance enhancing uh, perspective. Um, the insulin uh, sought to prevent uh, protein degradation and um, all, all these can lead to increased muscle bulk uh, potentially and possibly uh, uh, with the potential of improved performance. Um, this is just a, essentially an overview of uh, pathway in terms of from the growth hormone release and how it interacts with the liver and um, IGF-1 as well as the um, uh, effect that the insulin has on muscle, um, specifically amino acid transfer and protein acid transport and protein synthesis. Um, unfortunately, the growth hormone is, is widely available. Um, as we saw in um, 2014, documented in Russian doping in a number of countries, it can be ordered or purchased uh, in local pharmacies in some countries. Uh, it can also be ordered online. And the growth hormone sources are a combination of uh, recombinant um, and it can also be cadaveric.
Um, they can be detected by immunoassay. It's a fairly expensive blood test. And unfortunately, the um, half-life time is fairly short in a matter of hours in terms of trying to detect this. Um, thankfully, in terms of from an anti-doping perspective, most athletes that are using this are typically using other performance-enhancing drugs, so it increases their uh, probability of being caught. Um, number of growth hormone risks, um, uh, one from cadaveric sources, there's a risk of uh, Creutzfeldt jacob disease, but um, the other risks are, um, these are once again determined from either giving physiological doses uh, for um, medical patients that require uh, growth hormone replacement or a medical patient, a patients with a pathology that um, relates to increased release of growth hormone, such as acromegaly. Um, and so um, in, in a number of these cases where athletes may be using super physiological doses, um, we're, we're not fully aware of how severe um, these, these, um, these risks can potentially be. Uh, we're likely to include diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, proximal muscle weakness, prognathism, teeth whitening, um, a neuropathies as a result of uh, the changes, and then um, the potentiation of uh, tumor growth as well. Um, obviously, uh, insulin, uh, there's widespread availability uh, for its use. Exhausters, insulin um, can be detected by looking at C peptide levels in the blood. Um, the risks, obviously, of using uh, insulin include hypoglycemia, hypokalemia, uh, seizures, coma, and in fact, death. Um, I'm going to move on now. Um, just using one slide here, um, just to keep people updated, the, in terms of um, the likes of like uh, Ventolin or some of the uh, longer acting um, beta agonists, um, as long as we can use prescribed, whether it's salbutamol, femoral, or salmeterol, uh, these are typically um, uh, typically okay for use in a sport. Um, it's when these are being used beyond the prescribed, the typically prescribed doses, uh, that they become prohibited. Um, and I've just given those doses there. Um, then we go on to substances that are banned specifically in competition. Uh, these are amphetamines, uh, narcotics, cannabinoids, and glucocorticoids. Um, we're going to talk about the amphetamines in a second. Um, narcotics have been used, once again, obviously, um, um, given the um, example of uh, doping and cycling, there's been historic use of narcotics uh, during events to reduce the, the pain produced by these extreme endurance events. Uh, cannabinoids, um, some of the potentiation of uh, sleep and reducing recovery time is um, one of the main reasons for uh, prohibiting the, the substance. And then when we talk about glucocorticoids, excuse me, uh, there's some thoughts of that this can essentially uh, also potentiate uh, performance by um, increasing um, Increasing the output uh, during uh, during events. Um, we're going to move on to specifically amphetamines um, for a reason that this highlights really um, the, the the role of a physician uh, from a screening perspective. Um, these are fairly commonly prescribed uh, in the United States, uh, but uh, not that uncommon in Canada uh, to treat both attention deficit disorder, uh, ADHD, and, and sometimes um, some other anxiety uh, disorders. Um, so it's not unusual to come across athletes uh, that uh, were prescribed this prior to uh, joining either your sporting organization, or your sports team, um, um, or under your care. And you know this is kind of your role as a physician um, is uh, to educate athletes uh, at the beginning of a season or a competition season uh, about uh, both the, uh, doping and anti-doping and, and prohibited substances and how to become aware, uh, look at ingredients and ask for help. Um, screening, so when we're uh, doing pre-participation physicals with athletes, to ask them about uh, substances, both for, um, performance enhancing drugs as well as um, uh, medications that they might have been prescribed that are prohibited in sports, such as um, amphetamine-like substances. Um, and uh, guidance when athletes bring to you uh, certain substances that might have been recommended by trainers or uh, other athletes. 
and they don't know the ingredients or they have the ingredients and they're not sure about the source. Um, these are very important things. Um, so um, we're going to talk about the two separately. So uh, the first one is an athlete brings forward, a, let's say it's a, a substance um, such as um, a, a vitamin or a protein powder that's been recommended to them. Um, generally speaking, it's quite difficult to confirm what's in that substance and always the safest thing uh, in around competition, but also out of competition, um, is to recommend um, not to use the substance um, uh, if it's not, um, there's not a decent way of essentially verifying what's contained within it. Um, the second thing is um, um, there are um, certain organizations that aim to essentially um, uh, confirm and regulate some of these non-medical uh, substances, uh, such as like, you know, uh, creatinine, uh, cre sorry, creatine powder or uh, protein supplements. Um, but once again, um, if you're not certain, I, I wouldn't recommend it for, for the athlete. And there's, sometimes there's not a good way to confirm these things. Secondly, when they're talking, we're talking about an actual medication. Um, you're talking about, for example, an athlete comes in and they're on five ants, um, and you're about to start your competition season. Um, they're going to require a therapeutic use exemption. Um, we're going to go into a further slide to talk about the details of that. Uh, but these are very important. Um, it's not unusual uh, for athletes not to be aware that they require these and they may in fact have been competing without them in the past uh, without any prior issue. Um, but it's very important that you recognize this uh, so that you don't get caught out and you don't put your athlete at risk um, for being uh, uh, testing positive for a substance that they've been prescribed for a number of years. Important resource, I'd like to point out, uh, the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sports has a wonderful website where you can essentially search for a number of drugs. So if an athlete comes to you with, for example, a cold medication and you want to determine whether or not it contains something that may be prohibited in a particular sport, you can search as a medical physician or in fact as the athlete themselves and check off the sport that you're participating in and then do a search for that medication and they'll be able to give you the information whether or not that contains anything that's prohibited in sport. Um, next, we'll talk about reporting. Um, depends on your role in the sport. Obviously, if you're working in, a, in doping control, um, that is part of your described role is to, to report. Um, whereas if you're a, a team physician um, or the uh, physician athlete, you have to be aware of the uh, medical legal implications of privacy. Um, it's best that uh, if you're in doubt to contact your uh, local um, medical legal representation in Canada that would be your CMPA. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if an athlete comes forward uh, about performance enhancing drug use in a particular sport, you want to definitely talk to them and you uh, give them guidance uh, with respect to uh, coming forward uh, both to their sporting organization uh, and their team um, and um, with, uh, withdrawing themselves from, from competition um, and um, documenting also uh, potential risks um, and documenting their conversation with that athlete. And once again, if there's any question about your role to report, um, once again, that depending on the situation, I, I would I treat that as a case-by-case -case situation. I would definitely get um, uh, CMPA uh, involved uh, with helping um, helping you guide that uh, guide that decision. So let's move on to specifically the therapeutic use exemption. Uh, this is an example from uh, the International Cricket Council, but generally speaking, you get the patient's information um, and the uh, prescribing physician's information, and then you would put your information and contact information on the form, um, the substance that's been applied for. So for example, we have the athlete that's been taking Vyvanse, um, and then you get the athlete to essentially fill out a number of uh, release of information uh, forms so that uh, you can both communicate with their uh, prior prescribing physician and get all the information that's required. This differs from sporting organization to sporting organization, as does the time required to process a therapeutic use exemption. Um, there are exceptions for uh, urgent or emergent uh, treatments uh, that require 
um, uh, things where they require medical treatment, so for example, a hospital setting that may need to be given a medication that's prohibited in and out of sport, um, but is required for their uh, medical condition, and those can be usually processed at a quicker, quicker rate. But for something where an athlete's been taking medication for a long period of time, generally speaking, it's at least 30 days for most organizations and sometimes longer um, that's required. Um, and in the um, uh, example of Vyvanse, this may involve essentially getting information from the prior prescribing physician about the diagnostic process, perhaps neuropsychological testing, um, what medications have been used, how they got to the dose that they're at, the effect that the different medications have on the athlete, um, all these things to support their, the current use of the medication uh, while they're competing in the sport. So as we've seen um, with doping, uh, brings up a number of issues all along with limits um, um, in terms of, uh, from a monitoring perspective, um, limits with respect to ethics and then also concerns with respect to safety. These are um, often secretly used. Um, there is a lack of monitoring. This has to do with the cost of testing and costs of running such testing programs. World Anti-Doping Agency relies on donations from countries around the world, which can vary from uh, cycle to cycle and year to year. And this can obviously modify the amount of testing uh, that, can, that is available. Testing, unfortunately, often lags behind the production of new substances. Um, and as a result, there's often new, newer substances that are not necessarily detectable by older detection um, uh, methodologies. Um, as we saw, there's a number of health risks specifically to the substances themselves, but also with respect to, to the fact that we don't know um, whether these substances that are being produced are actually containing the substances they're describing, whether or not they're containing other harmful um, ingredients, and whether or not they've been modified en route, uh, whether it's coming from an underground lab or from an alternate country, whether they've been stored appropriately, and whether these uh, expiry dates uh, that we saw in some of these um, packaging that look quite legitimate um, are, are real or not. Um, and then obviously the, the bigger thing is with respect to why or why are we doing uh, antidoping in the first place, and this is to ensure uh, fairness in sport, uh, safety for the athletes, and also uh, the fact that these athletes are role models for the next and future generations. So it's ensuring safety and fairness for our future athletes uh, by um, maintaining um, a high standard, uh, both in education of anti-doping, um, but also screening and um, progressing with our monitoring. These are some of the references used in uh, producing this talk. And um, in summary, I, I, one of the things we talked about already um, in depth, but th these performance enhancing drugs are often used in combination. Um, even within a, cate a single category, they may use more than one substance. Um, so, so they may use several anabolics, um, uh, several uh, blood doping techniques. Um, the administration is unfortunately, it's not guided by either appropriate science or medical care. Uh, putting athletes at significant risk of harm. Side effects uh, can range from essentially th things like hair growth to uh, unfortunately uh, potential for uh, death. Um, these the sources of these substances that um, that are being obtained are often unknown, um, and um, the safety um, uh, of these substances is also unknown. And it's very important um, that we, we know our roles as physicians so that we can um, help our athletes as best as possible. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.